In this video, we are going to look at a few different alternatives for the design of arithmetic and logic units in a processor. First, we want to understand what exactly an ALU operation is and what kind of operations are being performed. What are the sources of operands? What is the destination? So the types of operations that are performed in an ALU. First things first, we typically need to think about arithmetic operations and the addition is probably the most basic arithmetic operation that we would be interested in doing inside a processor because in principle a lot of other things can be built on top of addition in particular multiplication could be done by repeated addition subtraction is also a useful operation to have although in principle if we have addition and some way of logical not being performed on values you could even emulate subtraction although that's probably just too complicated and not really worthwhile because addition and subtraction from a hardware point of view are very similar. So we can probably use the same hardware in order to do both. What about multiplication and division? These are very often not considered core requirements because most of the time multiplication can be done using uh, addition and you could either have like fixed value multiplication using shifting and adding of values or you could have a small subroutine, a function call that multiplies two values together and gives you the result. Division can be handled similarly. The problem in general, why even these and definitely more complex arithmetic operations are not always included as part of an ALU is that the ALU itself is usually implemented as just a simple piece of combinational logic. And therefore, the critical path, the delay through that combinational logic is a matter of prime concern. We do not want the critical path to grow large. We want to keep the logic as simple as possible. Now, along with arithmetic, we also typically include logical operations inside the ALU. The reason being that there may be situations where you want to just do some kind of AND or NOT XOR type of operations on data. And it turns out that Typically, those have a very low impact on the critical path because and if you're anding two 8-bit values together, all the and operations essentially happen in parallel. There is no rippling of a carry element or a carry bit through the circuit, which means that the logical operations are typically never the bottleneck as far as the critical path of the system is concerned. But of course, they do occupy area. So you don't want to unnecessarily add too many different logical operations either. Shifting is also one of the operations, the types of operations, which is very useful to have inside an ALU. So the question then becomes, okay, so we have all of these operations. How many operands should be there in one operation? Should we be using adders that take in two numbers at a time and give out one output? Or should we take three numbers, four numbers, n numbers? Because after all, in principle, it's possible to add as many numbers as you want at the same time. Of course, the question becomes, how do I provide all of those numbers, right? Do I have them all sitting in parallel as inputs to a module? But at least the question might become maybe having, you know, some value like 10 is obviously absurd, but the question does become, should I have two value adders or three value adders, for example? Does it make sense, for example, to consider three inputs to be added and summed up all at the same time? At the end of the day, this is once again an engineering trade-off between the complexity of the hardware and the utility of the operation. And we want to identify what could be the most useful, yet in some sense, minimal set of operations. Two value addition, for example, is always going to be sufficient. I can always add numbers two at a time and then use that in order to add three numbers or four numbers or any other set of values together. So most architectures you will find concentrate on this. Having said that, there are certain things called multiply accumulate operations, for example, where you would be interested in multiplying two values and adding with something else. There can be situations, in other words, where you might want to consider taking in multiple values or more than two values in a single operation all in one clock cycle. Those are rare. In general, we do not consider those for the purpose of our typical uh, logical operations or the arithmetic operations. So with this in mind, the question then becomes, how do we actually implement the internals of an ALU? 
how do we get these operands? It turns out that there are a few interesting things that you can look at even here. The most common one that we can think of is probably our, what I have discussed so far is basically corresponding to something called a three address architecture, where I would essentially have something which says add DST source one, source two. And the meaning of that small snippet of SMD language is basically take the values in register source one or memory location source one. Right? I'm sort of anticipating here by saying registers. In general, source one and source two could themselves be memory locations. But what I'm saying is take the values in location source one, add it to the location source two, and store the result in location DST. There are two inputs and one output. This is simple to understand. And the addresses themselves so, could be in main memory. Right? Source 1, source 2, and DST could be in main, main memory. But let's assume that we are working with a 32-bit address, in which case the main memory itself could be 32 bits, which means source 1 requires 32 bits, source 2 requires 32 bits, and destination also requires 32 bits. Effectively, it would mean that I would need four different words of the instruction in order to encode one instruction, add which seems very wasteful in some ways. On the other hand, what if I restrict myself to a specific subset of the memory and say that you know, I'm going to consider only 1K locations somewhere in one particular area of the memory. Then what I could do is I could use 10 bits for source one, 10 bits for source two, 10 bits for the destination and say that now, okay, I have you know 30 bits used for that, but then I have another two bits to indicate that this is an add operation. So now suddenly we have the situation where 10 address bits into three, it could be squeezed into a 32 bit instruction, for example. In practice, we don't really do even that. Typically what is done is you limit to a small address space, something like 32 registers. So when you have 32 registers, which is two to the power of five, then five address bits are sufficient for source one, five for source two and five for destination, 15 bits to encode all the operands and then the remaining bits can be used in order to encode the operations and various other variants. So add, add immediate, uh, subtract, all kinds of things could be done with the remaining bits that you have. This is ultimately a choice. Why did we choose 32 bit registers? That is a choice made as part of the RISC-V architecture. It's not something fundamental to processors. It's more an engineering trade-off between the complexity of building larger sets of registers and managing the number of bits that you have. So all this is for the regular or easy to understand three address operands. There can, on the other hand, be architectures where we decide that, look, why do I need three operands? Let me change my operations such that all of them become of the form that I'm just updating a register in place. Add destination comma source would basically mean that I take destination, whatever was the old value, and make it equal to destination plus source. I can once again, you know, use this quite easily in order to accumulate or keep adding a lot of values. I start off by initializing destination to zero and then I have add destination source one, add destination source two, add destination source three, and it adds all of them in place. The nice thing of course is it has one less operand to encode and you can directly update either a memory or a register using this. It does lose some degree of flexibility because I may have had a situation where I want to add two values and I don't want to lose the either of them. I want to keep both those values for doing something else as well, right? I don't want to have to load them again from memory or, you know, directly overwriting some location in memory as a result of doing this. We can go further. I can have a one address architecture where I basically say add source, add where. And here it turns out that there are architectures where we have something called a special accumulator register. And that accumulator register is the only one that can be the destination for any arithmetic operation. In some ways, the hardware becomes simpler, right? Always you have a fixed destination. What you're going to do is take any op arithmetic operation that needs to be done do it in your ALU and the output of the ALU is always hard coded or directed into this particular 
register, which is the accumulator. In some ways, the hardware becomes simpler and easier to build by doing this. But once again, it's a trade-off. You have lost some more flexibility compared to even the two address architectures. Can we go further than this? Yes, there is such a thing as a zero address architecture. I just give an operation add. Now, obviously it means, you know, how do I understand this? How do I think about what needs to be done? And the best way to look at it is in terms of something called a stack, right? A stack essentially says that all that you're allowed to do is push operands or push values onto the stack or pop values out of the stack. But you could also do something where you push two operands onto a stack, add them together, and then, or, or rather, the way that the uh, function would work would be, I pop out the last two values that were on the stack, add them together, and push the result back onto the stack. So I would essentially have something which looks like this. I put in the value v1, I put in the value v2, I pop, I just have v1 over here. Once again, I pop this. I have nothing over here, but now I do add and then I push and I get the result sitting over here, right? So you might wonder why you would go to this extent. It turns out that this is actually quite a nice architecture because of course, you know, a lot of the hardware is simplified. You know exactly where the addition is going to be done, where the sources are and where the destination is going to be. And it is also the basis of multiple programming languages. For example, the fourth programming language is completely stack based. Everything over there is done around the concept of a stack. And in terms of more popular languages or at least better known languages, at least nowadays, Java, the Java virtual machine is built around the concept of using a stack. So even though this might look somewhat painful to do, it turns out that this concept of a stack is actually nice in terms of how you can reason about the architecture and it's not a bad architecture in terms of the basic structure either. However, in our case, as far as the risk five is concerned, we are using the three address convention and we will be building the ALU based around that. So as I said, for the three address structure, the addresses could be directly in memory as well but memory typically has fairly high latency and larger memory blocks will have even higher delays and latency because we need to have larger multiplexers and decoders. So since it is inefficient to have ALU operations directly accessing external memory, we typically end up using a limited register set in order to actually do the operations. And that is the approach that will be followed in building the RISC-V ALU. 